On today's episode of the McCann Dogs Podcast. Good dog trainers are problem solvers. So what we do is we look and it's go and you know, we say right away, that's not working. How can I be better? How can I be better? How can I communicate with this dog to teach them what I want? Because obviously right now I'm failing them. And now, Instructor Shannon. Welcome back to the McCann Dogs Podcast. It is season four and I am in the studio today. I'm Instructor Shannon and I'm in the studio today with Instructor Christine. Hi everyone. We all know and love as Instructor Swanee. And today I want to talk a little bit about the importance of follow through and how that determines leadership and, you know, just all sorts of roundabout discussion on how we can make our lives easier both for and with our dogs. So today's topic is one that I think we're going to end up talking or touching on a lot of really important points when Mm -hmm. it comes to dogs. And unfortunately, there's a lot of misunderstanding when it comes to things like leadership and when it comes to things like follow through and what that follow through should look like or how that follow through should be applied, etc. And um, our methods and, and our philosophy of training is always to use the least amount of correction possible. So Mm -hmm. we want to aim for the most positive experience for everybody that we possibly can. But it's really important to note that positive doesn't mean you're letting the dog do whatever they want. It's not like the gentle parenting concept where you let the child dictate what's going on because unfortunately we're working with a different species. Mm -hmm. So their instincts and the things that they instinctively want to do are going to be contrary to our instincts and the things that we want to do and the things that we want to make sure are in place to keep them safe and help them to live an amazing life. Mm -hmm. So my first question for you, Instructor Mm -hmm. Swanee, my first question for you is what would you say the point of us training our dogs is? We want to train our dogs so they become reliable family members. We want them to be reliable. We uh, living with an unpredictable animal would be very difficult. Yeah, and possibly dangerous as yes. well. Yes. Um, any other things that spring to mind? But training keeps them safe. Yes, it does. It's that's it. that's huge. Yes. It's huge. Yes. The safety element is massive because even if you are the most diligent person in the world and you are always, you know, you always have your leash properly in your hand and you always have that leash attached to your dog and you always physically have control of your dog, There are times when things fail, you know, even if the Mm -hmm. leash breaks, if the front door gets left open when you're not ready for it, there's all sorts of things that we want to make sure that even if we can physically manage our dogs all the time. So say we have a little Bichon Frise, that's probably not going to be a dangerous dog at any point, even if it does become a bit of a biter, Mm -hmm. which ideally, of course, no dogs are biters. But say you you take in a small dog and you decide you're not going to train it, you'll probably get away with that a lot more than you would if you had a Rottweiler and brought them into the house and decided not to train them. So there's things like that to to think about, obviously. Right. But yeah, especially a dog that can outpower you. Yes. And it's amazing because I I think sometimes people who have never experienced the power of a dog don't understand how strong a dog is. That is true. Actually, my first dog was a Rottweiler and oh, I miss Quincy. She was such a good dog Mm -hmm. and I learned so much with her and she was such a willing partner. The work ethic was amazing, Mm -hmm. but she was powerful. Mm -hmm. And uh, and a really good example of that, when I would tug with her with a toy, if I didn't have a bungee in that toy, she could literally make me feel like my shoulder was going to come out of its socket. Mm -hmm. So with her tugging, there would be steady pressure. And then when I'd let off, she would do some thrashing, which is, you know, tossing their heads Mm -hmm. from side to side to to quote unquote, kill the prey. And if I had a toy that wasn't a bungee toy and she thrashed, that really hurt my shoulder. And it Mm -hmm. could almost knock me off my feet, to be honest. I mean, you would know you had Malinois. Yes. Yes. My, my Malinois. Wow. When they tugged, it was a force to be reckoned with. Or if they were uh, in full, you know, just just full excitement mode like yeah. that that's a tough dog that's a strong strong dog so luckily they were trained yes. and i was able to take control of the situations very easily yeah absolutely so definitely big reasons to do some training mm-hmm. is to be able to live with the dog to have safety and to yeah. know that things are going to be safe mm-hmm. i would say the next biggest thing is the joy and the freedom right yes. right and the joy in being able to give them mm-hmm. freedom like when i'm out hiking with my dogs and 
and I feel confident to take them off leash because I know that I've worked hard on my recall and this is the reward that I'm reaping from that. Mm -hmm. It's an amazing feeling to be out there exploring the world with my dogs off leash and to have this connection, even though there's not a leash on there. Yes. There's actually in our, in our training hall, there's a little sign and I don't know where, where it came from, but it says, we don't train our dogs to be robots. We train our dogs to give them freedom. Yes. yes. Precisely. Yes. Ding, ding, ding. That mm-hmm. is such a good, it's just one of the best sentences. Right. Yes. It really is. It is. Like the freedom that you can experience with a dog that is responsive to voice command mm-hmm. is absolutely amazing. Yes. And then all the gravy that comes after that. You know, right. if you did want to do sports or you did want to compete in obedience or, mm-hmm. you know, you wanted to do fun things with your dogs like parkour out in, in the environment right. or even just enjoy time at the yes. park with or, them. Or go into therapy dog work. Or yeah, um, I love that. Or the uh, library programs where children read to dogs. You know, you need a calm, quiet dog for that yes Yes. absolutely and that training is what Mm -hmm. allows you to have the calm quiet dog so even if you have a busier dog training them and teaching them an off switch will come in so handy Mm -hmm. for all the activities that you want to do yes um i I think that uh creating that ability to coexist and to also providing the dogs with a clear understanding of the rules yes this is something that is often overlooked Mm -hmm. as an important thing dogs are black and white creatures. They really want to know where the rules are, where those lines are, what they can do to stay in the safety zone and not, you know, upset the quote unquote pack. Mm -hmm. They want to know what the rules are. So not giving them rules, not giving them guidance can, can end up giving you all sorts of gray areas. And that leaves a dog in limbo. Right. It makes the dog quite frustrated. Yeah, Um, absolutely. I I can think of an analogy. Um, I remember when my son would come home from school and sit down and the teacher had been very clear and given him his homework and he would go home and he would just do his homework. But sometimes he'd come home from school and go, I don't understand what the teacher meant. Like, I don't know what am I doing? And I could see the stress oh, and the, and yeah. the, or the distress in him that he didn't, you know, he wanted to do the right thing, but he couldn't figure out what the teacher wanted. And that's the same with our puppies. Yeah. Uh, you know, dogs want to please us. They do. They, Dogs are very honest and they uh, truly are. Yes, they want to do the right thing. They're not vindictive. Yeah. But if we're not giving them clear information, they feel that same frustration. Yeah. That, like, I want to do it, but I I just don't understand. Absolutely. And not creating that communication with them is so damaging for our relationship. And, Mm. and, And based on something that you just said there, it's so obvious to me when we talk about not being able to communicate with our dogs and having that sort of gray area and gray space as humans, we then start to fill in the gaps of knowledge, right? So if in my head, I think that my dog is being stubborn when he doesn't turn on his name when I call him, then that's damaging to my relationship. It tells Mm -hmm. me to continue to think of this creature that I'm supposed to be teaching and nurturing and adoring, really. Mm -hmm. It tells me to think of them in a negative light, which builds animosity. And it ends up in a situation where then we start calling them stubborn and we start saying they're untrainable and we get frustrated with them and, and, and. Whereas when you take the time to develop a clear communication with your dog, it's so much easier to look at the scenario and say, oh, you know what? He didn't turn on his name because I haven't done my homework on that. Or he didn't turn on his name because the thing that he was sniffing in the corner was way too distracting for Mm -hmm. him. And I haven't done enough prep work to get to that point. And I shouldn't be expecting reliability on that response to name instead of just immediately saying he knows his name. He's being stubborn. Right. So, yes. yeah, Yeah. And I hate I hate having those um, those moments where you're you're trying really hard to keep things in perspective and to explain to a student about why their dog is doing a particular right, yes. thing, and their response back is so deeply ingrained in that stubborn. He's just being stubborn. That's why he's doing it, because that that to me tells me that you're never going to break through this moment in your training. If Mm -hmm. all you're going to do is label that as this stubborn behavior and not let the dog off the hook for a lack of understanding, then the animosity is just going to grow and grow and grow and become frustrating. And our dogs really deserve so much better than that. And they really are better than that. They are. Yes. So good dog trainers are problem solvers. Yes. So what we do is we look and it's go, and you know, we say right away, that's not working. How can I be better? Yeah. How can I be better? How can I communicate with this dog? 
to teach them what I want. Because obviously right now I'm failing them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So um, going back to the McCann method and what our desires are, again, we want to present positive training. Mm -hmm. We want to train our dogs in the most positive way we possibly can Mm -hmm. using the least amount of correction and aversive as we possibly can, Mm -hmm. as long as it gets results. Right. And that is the piece that a lot of times gets missed these days Mm -hmm. because we're in this busy world and, you know, people have priorities other than the dogs, et cetera, et cetera, is that sometimes the results don't necessarily drive our behavior. We want to either, you know, give the dog something to tire them out, Mm -hmm. Uh, which would be, you know, all these modern forms of enrichment like daycare and mm-hmm. things like that, because right now we don't have the time to tire them out. You know, we're busy from coming home from work or we want to just say, you know what, I'm going to accept this bad behavior. I'll let myself off the hook by blaming it on breed or the dog being stubborn or mm-hmm. something like that. And then unfortunately, the results never really catch up. And right. you end up in a situation where you're frustrated with the dog, they're frustrated with you, and you never really come together. So uh, today, talking about the importance of follow through leads me to the idea that we need to be clear with our dogs. Right. And that comes through repetition, training, etc. And yeah, and not expecting too much too fast. Yes, People exactly. People think dog training happens in a couple of days. Yeah, no, it takes some time. Takes some time. Yes, yeah. yeah, and we and we expect too much, too little of ourselves. Yes, yes, yeah. So high expectations are important. Um, what would you say in a nutshell? So we talked about um, training and the point of training. Mm-hmm. In in a nutshell, I like that expression. <laughs> what would you say is uh, makes a good leader? What would you say the qualities are that makes a good leader? I think consistency. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the ability to, to teach, the yes. ability to be Perfect. calm and to teach, um, the ability to, to, to read the, the, the dog's body language. Yes. Yes. To, to say, okay, I can see what this situation is. Here's how to fix it. Perfect. Um, I think that uh, good leaders are calm, clear, and fair. Yes. And I think that. Oh yeah. The- I guess yours, you were more in a nutshell than I was. Oh, that's okay. I, I, I was I, more prepared. I escaped out of the nutshell. <laughs> I had it in my talking yeah, point. My nutshell so. broke open and flowed out. <laughs> <laughs> but that's that's what happens when you're on the surprise end of the I know, I'm questions. the surprise so question. Yes, yes. No, I think that your leadership qualities are perfect. And I think that um, your leadership qualities towards your dog are perfect. And oh, I think you. that uh, both of our descriptions were very, right, very yeah. good. Um, Mine was more like peanut butter. I like peanut butter. I like peanut butter. (laughs) Actually, I love peanut butter. Um, So I think that leadership has gotten very confused in our dog training society. And it's become, you know, there was a popular TV show that made leadership be all about the sort of pack dynamics. And unfortunately, that that sort of confused where the pack stuff comes into play and where the leadership stuff comes into play. And there seems to be like one side of the world that says dogs don't really operate in a pack sort of mentality and another side of the world that says that they do. And of course, those sides can often bicker with one another. And I like to explain leadership as the thing that provides the dog with someone to give them good advice, someone to look to for direction. And I think that where the pack theory stuff has gotten really confused is when humans step in and try to pretend that we're dogs. So anybody who has lived with multiple dogs knows that there's rules and structure and there is hierarchy Mm -hmm. and order and there's all these things there Mm -hmm. that are sort of like just lurking under the surface that allow dogs to communicate well with one another and keep from fighting with one another. Mm -hmm. It's when there's not those clear definitions that you can get squabbles in the quote unquote pack. Mm -hmm. You can get, um, you can get dogs that are a little bit uh, um, in limbo as they're trying to find that, that new status or that new order, you know, as some dogs get older, things Mm -hmm. will change and dynamics will change. So you will see different communication styles and you will see a a hierarchy of sorts when you're living with multiple dogs. Would Mm -hmm. you agree? Yes. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. What's the big biggest number of, of dogs you've had in your house at once? Three. Three. Okay. Yeah. Three living at once. But I always look at it. It's dogs have been domesticated for a long time. That they they're, have. they're not wild creatures and I'm not a dog. So that is exactly, I'm it. not part of a pack. Yes. I am the, I'm the leader 
And I, if there's something I don't like, yeah. I step in. Hey, hey, we don't do this. That's not part of our life. Yes, and, exactly. Uh, you know, I know they communicate with each other and they have their own little things with each other, but I overrule all that. Yeah, 100% yes. as the leader. And by giving good guidance and giving good information, that's how you end up in that position. And I think like something you said there, but I, I'm not sure if I'll have to listen to it back and see if I went ding, ding, ding out loud <laughs> or if that was just in my head. But literally it's when humans step in and try to become part of that pack that things get confused. Right. Like yes. humans stepping in and becoming pack leader is just, it's such a silly notion to think yes. of us inside the pack. And then of course it leads to behaviors like, it leads to humans trying things like alpha roles mm. because they're trying to be dog-like. Right, yeah. And right? we're not so dogs. We're not dogs. It's our that, dog's job to fit into our lives. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. And that is the ridiculousness of the world talking about pack mentality versus not. It's when the humans step in and try to be part of that, that it becomes silly and skewed. So right. it, with dogs, you are definitely going to see, you're going to see them work out squabbles. You're going to see them defer to one another over mm -hmm. different things. And it depends on a lot of things. It depends on how important that particular resource is to a dog. So can you think of any, um, of any situations that came up between your multiple dogs where you would say, oh, that particular dog, like for example, I would say Reggie, is top of the heap in my house when it comes to anything food. Mm -hmm. Any other dog that has lived with Reggie, and he's 15, so he's had multiple dogs that, you know, I've said goodbye to over the years, and then he's seen mm -hmm. new dogs come in. But I would say no dogs in the house would ever challenge Reggie when it comes to food, because Reggie, to Reggie, has a walking stomach. <laughs> the most important thing in the world to him is food. Right. He absolutely loves food. So he would give off, give off vibes when mm -hmm. it came to food that would say, don't challenge me for this. This is mine. Mm -hmm. And if there was some sort of a challenge between the pack members, the dog members in the house, it would be worked out by myself. Mm -hmm. You know, I wouldn't leave it to the dogs to work things out because I don't want them competing. Right. I don't want there to be any squabbles. Mm -hmm. Now, if I were to say that same thing, so Reggie would be top of the heap in the pack when it comes to food. Mm -hmm. Ned would be top of the heap in the pack when it comes to toys. Mm -hmm. So, you know, ne toys are more important to Ned. Ned right. tends to be a little bit of a hoarder and we've, mm -hmm. you know, we've... <laughs> We've spent a lot of time giggling at Ned mm -hmm. as he tends to pick up a toy, bring it over to his bed, go and find another toy, bring it over to his bed, and then he hangs out happily on his bed with all the toys, right. and he's just thrilled. And none of the other dogs in the house would challenge him in that situation for any of those toys. Mm -hmm. So in that scenario, Ned is top of the heap. Right. You know, it, it really, it, it, it's going to flux, it's going to shift, mm -hmm. and you're going to see different things based on what's important for each particular dog member right. in the yes. pack. So yes. we don't get down there and worry about any of those no. things. We don't sniff each other's butts, you know, some of us maybe, but not, <laughs> not as a rule, you know, we, right. we act differently. So right. we, yes. we don't want to try to pretend to be a member of the dog pack. That was a wayward dog jumping through the studio. Right. That just yes. Bumped that the just microphone bumped the microphone. There. Yes. <laughs> it was, a it wasn't me. Swanee's knee. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. And that's the part that I think really gets confused right. is where we fit as humans into this dynamic. And people think that they need Need to pretend to be dogs and they need to do things like dogs would do like we even see you know if you google and look at some of the things that are out there in the internet and facebook and you know you see people growling at their dogs in response to their dogs growling at them mm -hmm. i've seen somebody bite their dog's ear after their dog bit them and like things oh. it's just Silly, silly. Yes. absolutely silly. You are never going to get anywhere and your dog is never going to be confused that you are in charge because you are a dog, even though you look like a human right. by trying to be a dog. Yes. I always well, And too, if you think about uh, people who rely on their dogs, so yes. a, a farmer relies on his dog to bring in his sheep and those dogs listen to that farmer, like, yeah. wow, do they listen? And you know what? That farmer's not pretending he's a dog. No. He's a human that's in charge and yeah. the dogs are loving it. They're Absolutely. like, what can we do for you? Yeah. And we're never going to see that farmer, you know, growling at his dog or no. biting his dog ear. Not likely. No. So, <laughs> you know, think of people who are, or, or police officers with their dogs, uh, like they're a strong leader yes. and those dogs listen. Yeah. Um, dogs in the army, you know, you know, so think of people who rely on their dogs. They're not doing anything 
weird with them, weird and human like with yeah. them. Yeah. No, absolutely. And yes. if you if you're watching good dog trainers with their dogs, mm-hmm. you are not going to see anything like that. Unless right. we're being goofy, silly people and trying right. to pretend to be dogs. Right, yes. But yes. When it, we all are silly. We like are I've, we are yeah, very silly. Yeah, like I've <laughs> gone on all fours and uh, you know, run across the floor and play bow to my dogs and picked up a toy in my mouth. You know, I, I I'm not ashamed to admit it. But my dogs are trained yes. and you know, they just look and at you're me not, and go. You're not using it as a means of no, keeping them under no, control. No, you're it's being just, goofy. It's one of those goofy moments. I'm, I'm a goofy person. I'm glad I'm not the only one. No, I'm a goofy person. And sometimes it's fun to do something goofy. Yeah. And, yeah, and I'll, I'll admit it. Yeah. <laughs> I often will. Uh, I often will if my dog's over sniffing something, you know, if we're on trail right, or something, yeah. for example, and they're over sniffing something for a long time, yeah. I'll go running over and pretend I'm interested too, just to be goofy <laughs> and just to, you know, right. have a little moment. Right. But, yeah. Yeah. Um, it's fun. Yeah. It's. Yeah, you got to laugh at yourself sometimes oh, and have fun in life. Yes. I also really like to know what interests them. It mm-hmm. interests me to watch them. Like I could literally just sit and observe dogs yes. all day long and be mm-hmm. like, that's really interesting. I wonder why all of a sudden he got that in his mind right? to yeah. do. Or, yeah. you know, I just find them to be fascinating. Right, they are. Yes. For sure. When my son was young, mm-hmm. I hope my son never listens to these podcasts because <laughs> there's a lot of stories about him. He might when he gets older. I think right now he's at an age where, yeah, yeah, whatever your mom does is not something you want to. Not cool. Yeah, you don't not want cool. to participate no, in. in what your mom's doing. But uh, when he was little, I remember taking my Saluki cowboy for a walk and Ty, you know, walking along with us, he might be four. And every time cowboy stopped to sniff something, if we were allowing her to stop and sniff, Ty's like, I'm going to sniff everything cowboy sniffs. That's hilarious. So I had to be very careful, of yes. course, because I don't want my son sniffing the bottom of a telephone pole nope. or fire hydrant. But uh, no, nope, yeah, but it was it's just so funny. Eh? I, yeah. I want, what's cowboy smelling? I need to smell it, too. <laughs> I think he soon realized there was nothing really for a human to smell so it's not like it was you know chocolate or cake or anything or roast beef down there (laughs) (laughs) you lose interest in a hurry right yes yeah yeah it didn't last long a few blocks maybe oh my goodness (laughs) so there you go you can pretend to be a dog when it comes to being goofy or if you're a child right but the rest of the time be a leader and be, right, be, yes. be a good human leader. You don't need to be a dog. And I wanted to say, um, you know, when when people try to mimic dogs and they do things like alpha roll the dogs, mm. if you actually watch dogs communicating with one another and the alpha roll, the when one dog rolls another dog and the there's a dog on its back with another dog standing over top of mm-hmm. it or sometimes holding them by the neck, et cetera, that's, uh, that's an alpha rule in dog language and when dogs do it what gets missed by the human is that the dog on the bottom is not being physically pinned down Mm -mm. the dog on the bottom is submitting and he is saying i give i'm gonna lay here until you're finished you know exerting your authority and then when you move off i'll have learned my lesson and life goes on Mm -hmm. when we do it as humans we physically try to pin the dog in place in in our efforts to mimic other dogs and that actually puts the dog in what we call a fight or flight response Mm -hmm. where their only option now is to fight back because they can't get away from you. And if you're physically pinning them, it doesn't give them an opportunity to give you clear body language and clear indication that they're not trying to give you any trouble. So, mm-hmm. you know, those things are definitely not good leadership right. tactics. Yes. It's not changing the dog's mental state at all. You're exactly. basically saying, I'm stronger than you. Yeah, that, absolutely. That's it. Yes. And we, we see TV shows that do things like this. Yes. But we're seeing edited TV yeah. shows, well edited TV shows. Absolutely. And there's an awful lot behind the scenes that you know that they don't show the tv audience yeah precisely and definitely not methods that we would recommend you try to mimic so what makes a good leader is being calm clear and fair what makes a good leader is using good management Mm -hmm. and good training and i would say those are the two key ingredients Mm -hmm. so um tell us about good management what does good management look like well with the puppy management is not giving them too much freedom And that's one of the biggest mistakes we see is people giving young dogs, uh, puppies or dogs that they've just rescued or even their adult dogs way too much freedom. And the dog makes the wrong choices. And because we're not there to help them, the dog thinks that choice is right. And, you know, then we label them, well, he was bad. Yeah. It's like, well, no, you were bad by not managing him. Yes. He was being a dog. Right. (laughs) You were not managing well and not being a good leader. So, yes. Um, Management. So what are some management tools? Well, a crate Mm -hmm. is a management tool. Uh, Supervision is a management tool. A house line on your dog is a management tool. 
um, you know, anything that keeps the dog from getting into mischief. Yeah, absolutely. Anything that you can use as a fail safe. Right. And I shouldn't right. even say getting into mischief. Yeah. Anything that stops the dog from being an animal. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> you know what? Right. And that is so good. I think it's so important to like catch ourselves on those moments right. yes. as well, because that language is so different from one thing to the next, right? right? From getting into mischief in the human perspective mm-hmm. to... Just making choices a that yes. a dog would make. And that was bad of me to say that. No, bad, no. Cr- bad no, Christine. It was, it was good conversation, <laughs> but hey, right, go ahead. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> what we want to do as good leaders is give direction. So right. if we let our dogs make mistakes, mm-hmm. if we let them do things that, and, and, and again, it's not even a mistake. It's just them being a dog. Dogs right. are scavengers by nature. They like to get into things. They right. like to explore things. Yes. This is and very reinforcing for them. They like to them. rip and tear. Oh, you know, yeah. as a, a, a wild animal has rip to and rip tear. and tear its food. So uh, dogs, you know, they're not wild animals, but they have genetics in them that they yes. can call up. So the, the process of tearing something is very satisfying to yeah, them. Yeah, absolutely. Like us popping bubbles on bubble wrap. Oh, I do love some good there, bubble wrap. Yep, very satisfying. <laughs> so you know, to, I to take manage, the whole thing and twist it yes. so it goes. So if anyone has Shannon at their house to manage her, <laughs> they must either keep their bubble wrap away or put a little pen around her. Or give me lots of bubble wrap that I can play with and I'll be occupied for yes. hours. <laughs> I do love good bubble wrap. (laughs) Um, Yeah, so the management thing is, I would say, depending on the age of the dog, just as important as the training piece. So when they're older... And, you know, once you get through all of this training piece, Mm -hmm. once they understand the rules of the house, the management piece is no longer important because they understand how to make good choices. Mm -hmm. But if we bring them into our lives and right off the bat expect them to make human side choices instead of dog side choices, Mm -hmm. we're going to fail miserably. They're going to fail miserably. And then we end up telling them they're wrong, they're wrong, they're wrong, they're wrong, they're wrong. So if my dog's constantly getting into the garbage because I'm constantly leaving them access to make that choice, I'm telling them they're wrong over and over again, which is damaging to my relationship. But it's also the rehearsal factor that I need to be concerned about because the more the dog gets into the garbage, the more it gets reinforced through both scavenging Mm -hmm. and if they happen to find something that's really tasty and rewarding in the garbage, that is going to play into things as well. Mm -hmm. And it's just fun to stick your head in there and pull out Kleenex and shred it up. And (laughs) I find that as well. I know I have to watch myself all the time, especially, (laughs) especially when I go to someone's house. (laughs) I've seen you. I've actually warned when we've gone to mutual engagements together, I've actually warned people to to make sure their garbage is empty. Or or put a lid, put Put, a lid on your garbage. Yeah. It's funny. Can't figure that part out. (laughs) you know we were uh ty and i were hiking up uh, in tobermory and uh they have bear safe garbage cans okay and ty and i were well they're also christine safe garbage cans (laughs) i could not figure out for the life of me how to open up the bear garbage can oh my gosh and i was in in a line so i was in the line trying to do it and nobody in the line helped me they were all just enjoying watching me finally ty walked over and said mom and opens it up for me and it's like (laughs) I was so embarrassed. Oh, so anyways, yeah, yeah, yeah. That I think bear safe. Yeah, garbage. yeah. So I, yeah, I'm afraid now to take any garbage into a bear area because I won't figure out the garbage can. And I'm going to keep this in mind for next time we're going to somebody's house together. I'm, I'm going to say bear proof garbage bear, cans. Yes. That's the only way to keep Swanee <laughs> out of your tissues. <laughs> But yeah, so the rehearsal factor of right. this, right? The dog doing this over and over and over again will become the permanent habit. Mm-hmm. So that that it, this problem that you're not managing initially and the dog is being able to get into the garbage over and over and over again is actually you're, you're teaching them to have this lifelong problem because you're allowing the rehearsal of that thing and you're not putting measures in place to prevent it from happening. Right. So that's where management is so very important. And right. then of course you spend the rest of your life saying, my dog will not stay out of the garbage. Right. They're well, so stubborn. Look, we even manage bears. <laughs> we are managing bears. So it's, you know, it should be easy to manage yeah, dogs. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> Just put bear proof garbage cans in your kitchen. Right. Alrighty. So the management piece and then the training piece. For me, these are the two key ingredients to good leadership. So we make sure that our dogs don't continue to make the wrong choices Mm -hmm. when we're, you know, when they're growing up and they're still, they still need more time to get all the lessons in before they understand what the rules of their house are. So think about the first, you know, 
I would say, how long would you say? If you've if you're bringing home a puppy, right? How long do you think that you do heavy duty management for? Oh, quite a while, quite a while, yeah. like months and months and months. Yeah, I think absolutely, it's, yes, yes. I usually I, I, was. Well, I don't want my puppy to do anything as a puppy that I don't want him to do as an adult. Dog. Brilliant. Yeah. So it might be cute for the puppy to you know sit on the couch with me, but if I don't want the puppy on the couch as an adult, if I don't say I have like a, a giant breed or a hairy drooly breed and I don't want them on the couch as an adult, I'm teaching them as a puppy, they can. Yeah. Now it's not fun as an adult. So yeah. it's very confusing to the dog. Let's pause for a minute. It's time to get honest with ourselves. Head on over to the McCann Dogs Training YouTube channel and take the leadership assessment. See where you are and use that information to adjust your training. The link will be in the description below. Happy training. We can all have different rules, right? So you mentioned specifically having the dog up on the couch with you. And I'm sure that uh, people are wondering if that's okay. And Sometimes it absolutely is. It really, it depends on the dog and the situation. And if you have a good old dog that's not causing you Mm -hmm. any sort of trouble at all, there's absolutely no reason if you want them on the couch that you can't have them on the couch. With my own dogs, I like to have an invite only policy, Mm -hmm. which really, I mean, I invite them all the time. I never (laughs) deny them. But what happens is it allows me to make the choice. So if I have guests over, for example, and they're not really keen on having the dogs in their lap on the couch then my dogs won't jump on the couch Mm -hmm. until I've said, yeah, puppy come and padded the seat. So that's their invite, right? Mm -hmm. If they, I teach them that if they try to get up on the couch without that permission, they're not allowed to get up on the couch. Mm -hmm. So things like that are good leadership, right? Because now when I have guests over, instead of me having to like consistently, you know, keep a hold of my Mm -hmm. dogs or put them away or allow them to just be right. goofy and jump on my guest's lap. Mm-hmm. I now have this system in place where they know that they need to just ask for permission first. Right, and if yes. they're not granted permission, mm-hmm. then they wait until they are sort of thing. Yes. So, or, or if you travel to a cottage or travel to a hotel too, yeah. you know, you, you don't want your dogs to be sitting on the hotel furniture and on cottage furniture. Um, you know, not everyone likes that. So yeah. I always want to be the best dog owner and the most respectable dog owner. So that way too, your dogs are not just like jumping up on the couch, especially if they've just been in the lake. Yes. You know, they're not ruining other people's property. That happens a lot with tollers. Yes. For I know sure. that's why I said they jump in the lake. Yeah. Yes. So rules can be different for everybody and you can decide what makes sense for you and what doesn't make sense for right. you. Yes. And then you can use that to consistently drive your dog's behavior and drive their understanding mm-hmm. of the rules. Even things like, you have an old couch. Oh, it's okay for the dog to get on it. It's yeah. an old couch. And then I go and buy an expensive fancy couch. And what? well, now, no, I don't want the dog on yeah. the couch. But now the dog's like, well, what? I was, for years, you've allowed me on that couch. Yeah. What? What's, I don't understand. So, yeah. you know, think of two. You might have an old couch now, but you might not have an old couch in two years. Yeah, for sure. And I actually, um, I, I like the idea of the dogs having their own space as well mm-hmm. so that, they always have sort of a place to go. Right. Um, but with my own house, all the furniture is dog furniture. I don't know that I'll ever have furniture that's so nice that dogs won't be able to be on it. So I'm good. <laughs> I'm good with that. I, I don't like my dogs on the furniture. I, okay. Honda is non-shedding. He's the first dog I've allowed on furniture. Ah, and he's so very it's the, tiny. It's the hair. Yes. And yeah. he, I put a little, uh, he's got his own little waterproof blanket on too because he gets nice. on the couch and he licks his foot. Oh, okay. And of course, then he starts missing his foot and licking the couch. <laughs> and I just don't want dog breath <laughs> on my couch. So he has to lay in his waterproof pad. I've wondered what the smell was in your house. <laughs> no, no, there's no, there's no smell because I don't let dog breath oh, be course. in my couch. <laughs> of course. Absolutely. <laughs> Not that Honda has, Honda has beautiful breath. He got, his, of course he, got he, a, he got some dental work done and he's got lovely breath Aww. for a 14 year old dog. Good. Yes. Excellent. Mm -hmm. So yeah, rules are totally up to you. What's important is that you're consistent with those rules and you use good management and good training to help establish those rules, whether you want your dog on the couch or don't want your dog on the couch. And there's ticks too. Yeah. Now with Southern Ontario is is really become a tick paradise. It's where all ticks come to vacation. (laughs) (laughs) And set up permanent residence, it seems. And I, you know, I don't want, uh, you know, my my family sitting on my couch coming over for a visit and leaving with a tick on their butt. (laughs) Yeah. That's, yes. So, yes. I'm so, I'm so over ticks right now. I I gotta say. Yes. 
so many tick checks and preventatives and all that. And right. There's no perfect anything right. out there. It we seems. need we need children now to uh, focus on tick research. So yes. encourage your kids to uh, go. To, I guess take biology. <laughs> yes. Go to university and study about ticks and tick prevention. Exactly. Yes. All right. I have one more key ingredient here and we're talking about follow through. So we've talked about management. We've talked about training. Mm -hmm. Would you have a guess on what the other key ingredient is? Is Did we talk about follow through? You said we did. Well, we're, we're talking about follow through. <laughs> the bigger, I was trying to give you a hint. <laughs> is it? I, I, you know what? I've missed your hint and uh, it's now I'm good. just wishing I had some candy. My <laughs> <laughs> I will give you some candy when we're done the podcast. But actually, no, what? no candy, no for, candy for me. My third point is learning how to say no. Oh, okay. And this is the piece that is really misunderstood and the follow through piece that is lacking, mm. I think, a lot of times in our in our dog training out in I, society. I think especially for women too, because we, yeah, we're, nurturing we're nurturers. And we want you got it. Yeah, you know, when we love something, we want it to we want to say yes. Yeah. But we just want to hug it and tell it it's wonderful. Right. Yeah. But we can't. We yeah. can't. Yeah. And we can't do that with our children. We have to nurture them and love them, but we have to say no sometimes to our exactly. kids. Exactly. And very much to our dogs too. Exactly. So when it comes to follow through and being able to say no, a lot of the times this comes with training in and, it's in and of itself mm -hmm. and having nice ways to be able to say no or having nice ways to be able to gently insist right. on the follow through piece of things. Mm -hmm. So for example, if I am working on having my dog sit in control position, which control position for us is at your left hand side. So it's sort of like a heel position. Mm -hmm. And basically I want to be able to at any point take control of my dog by telling them get in or by using a sit placement mm -hmm. to move my dog to my side. So with a young dog who doesn't understand the skill of get in yet, which basically get in is just our way of saying move to my side and sit until right. I give you further information or further direction. Um, so I can use my get in command once it's taught or I can use the sit placement before I have that get in command. Mm -hmm. And I can also use my sit placement in situations where my dog says, no, I don't want to sit at mm -hmm. this point or I'm not going to keep sitting at this point. Right. So I think that those things are one of the crucial components that often gets missed. Yes. And especially as our society goes more and more towards this like altruistic vision of purely positive training methods, mm -hmm. which is such a lovely thing. It is wonderful that our society has come so far yes. when yes. it comes to kindness with animals. And mm -hmm. I cannot express that enough. You know, Deb and Marty, 40 years ago, 41 now he left the um, obedience club they were training mm -hmm. with to move on and start their own thing because the obedience club they were training with didn't want to allow food in training and it was very much poo-pooed mm -hmm. poo-pooed I said that again. I think I said that uh, on another recent episode. We've talked about poo -poo's in yeah. another one, yes. <laughs> I, it's, I just, every time I say it, I have to follow it up with poo-poo. Poo-poo. <laughs> so uh, things have changed for the better, and that is so nice. Yes. We're understanding our dogs more. We're looking at them as these creatures that are thinking, feeling, being. So mm -hmm. we want to be... We want to be kind and we want to be gentle. And I could not agree more that that is important, mm -hmm. but it should never trump the results part, right? Because the results part allow for the joy and they, it allows for the freedom mm -hmm. and it allows for all of the things that we want to enjoy about our dogs to be able to live safely and harmoniously and also joyfully with them. Right. Yes. So, it's like if humans, if we lived in a purely positive world, there'd be all kinds of people speeding. There'd be all kinds yeah. of people looting houses. There, there'd be a little bit of chaos. Yeah. Um, you know, if police officers just stopped you and said, don't do that again, yeah. we'd be like, I going to do it again. <laughs> but the police officer gives us or, a ticket. Even better, if they waited until they saw you not speeding, pulled you over and gave you five bucks. Like, that's nice. But what about all the times I'm speeding then? Right. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so you figure we have rules in our world yes, that have consequences absolutely. that we need to follow. Yeah. And so dogs need to have some consequences too. And we're not, they're not mean consequences. They're just, you must. Yeah. It's just reality for life. And the follow through is a really important piece to make sure that the dogs end up with the results. Right. So 
having a dog that only gets half of the information, that only gets a small part of the picture, and then is I, I'm gonna I'm gonna use the sit in control position as mm-hmm. an example. So in our philosophy of training, if you get up from the sit at your side before you have been released, mm-hmm. you get placed back. Yes. And it's not a mean correction. It's nope. not even a correction, I would say. Nope. It's just cutting the leash, gripping by the clip, saying sit, guiding up with the leash, and then placing the rear into position. Right. And it is what I call gentle insistence. Yes. And we like to have ways mm-hmm. of gently insisting with our dogs because then we can have the best of both worlds. Right. So that sit placement, it's not mean. It's not hurtful. It's not physically harmful for the dog in any way, but it says you must. Right. It says you're not allowed to get up until I say break or okay Mm -hmm. or whatever my release word is and give you permission to get up out of the sit. And we do it in a timely fashion that the dog understands. So I watch my dog the moment their little butt comes up off the ground within one second. So that same moment I'm placing the dog's butt back on the ground. That way the dog says, oh, I I get what my mistake is. If we allow our dog to get up and rush out to the end of the leash and bop around, by the time we bring the dog back and sit, it's been lost on the dog. The dog goes, I don't know what you're doing. So it's important to react quickly. Yeah, absolutely. So, okay, here's the scenario. My dog's sitting at my side. I've placed them in the sit at my side. The expectation from me is that they hold position until I say, okay, and let them get up. Mm -hmm. If my dog breaks position before I've said, okay, what would your response be? I would uh, immediately, I usually use a little oops, like just a little marker word that helps catch the dog's attention. And it also helps them understand when they made their error. So as the butt comes up, I'm going to go oops and, or hey, Something like that, just yep. quick and short. And as I'm saying that, my arms are in motion, placing the dog back. Perfect. Once they're sitting, I'm going to make sure they're sitting. I'm going to let them calm down or settle for a moment or two. Then I'm going to start to praise. What a good dog. Excellent. That's good. Once they've sat maybe five or six seconds, yes and feed. Yes and feed. Hooray. I'm going to create value for sitting beside me. Perfect. And when you are doing that, um, after you've done the actual placement, mm-hmm. we always want to make sure that we are loosening back up Loose on up the leash. dog's yes. leash. And standing such up straight a, again. Yeah. I'm not hovering over them. Yeah, such a crucial component. And uh, a lot of the times when we do that, we place the sit, we loosen the leash, what happens? They pop right back up again. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And what do we do? We do the exact same thing again. Excellent. Yeah, so. I often say to students, if they get up a hundred times, you're going to place them back 101 times. Brilliant. Yes. And literally, if we had a counter, sometimes we would probably oh. hit that hundred oh, mark. Oh, yes. Yes. Sometimes, With some wiggly dogs. Yeah. Yes. Sometimes the dogs that come in for class are incredibly excited. But here's the reverse side of that coin. So if I have placed my dog in the sit at my side mm-hmm. and they choose to get up and I either don't place them back or... I ask them to sit again and I give them that option to just follow direction or not. What do you think the fallout from that is going to be? The dog's going to learn that we're kind of wishy-washy and if they don't feel like listening to us, they don't have to. Yes. And then that day when they're running off after a squirrel and we call them, the dog's going to say, you know what? I've never had to listen to you in the past. I like this squirrel. Off I go. And you know, that could, you know, and you know, be the demise of your dog. Oh, that was oh, the wrong that's button. Not right. Oh, oh that. I thought we had a crowd cheering oh, button, right. but we don't. Oh. It was my intention there to Woo! like right. Yeah, exactly. Like that was so well said. So there's a couple of components there that were just so well said. One of them is that the little things make a huge difference when it comes to the big things. So yes. placing my dog back in the sit at my side and nicely saying you must in that scenario and saying, you know what, you're just going to hold that sit there until I release you and it's no big deal and mm-hmm. you're doing great. You're doing great. You're back mm-hmm. in that sit. You're doing great now. And helping them understand that that fair follow through is something that is going to happen every single time means my dog starts to pay much more attention to me Mm -hmm. than he does to his own little world at that moment. So, you know, maybe he was looking at a bug on the ground that he wanted to chase and lick. Well, Mm -hmm. that bug's not as interesting anymore because now I'm getting direction and I'm getting good rewards for, for, you know, holding this sit. 
And when I do get up, I get good information that says that's not allowed at this point. Mm -hmm. And all of the little things there really carry over to the big things. Yes. So now when my dog is chasing a squirrel towards the road, and this is, of course, assuming that right. I trained a recall. Yes. My dog is chasing a squirrel towards the road. There's traffic coming. And I say, come. My dog has learned to expect that there will be follow through if mm -hmm. they don't come, that it's rewarding for them to come, mm -hmm. and that there's really not another option. Right. And this is how we get to the golden spot, the yes. the, the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, mm -hmm. so to speak, with our training methods. Right. It's that we make sure that we address the dog on both sides of the coin, mm -hmm. but because we want to be positive trainers, we have methods to do that kindly and gently and nicely without you know, relying on giant corrections that make the dog think, oh, it's terrifying to do this thing that I want to do. So I'm just going terrifying or painful or whatever mm -hmm. the case may be. So I'm just going to, you know, sit here nicely and be suppressed. They're joyful in wanting to work for us, but they know that there are absolute you must in place. Right. Yeah. So I like to talk about um, a, a couple of the ways that we teach gentle insistence, yes. I call it. So yes. um, well, tell us about the down placement. The down, the down placement is basically we are, we've asked the dog to lie down. The dog says, I don't feel like lying down right now. So we have gotten the dog used to in our, in our practicing mm -hmm. that we can put a little bit of touch, a little bit of pressure on the dog's shoulder blades. And we've taught them that that means you must lie down. Perfect. And we've done so right from the start when they're little puppies. Yeah. So the dog says, I don't want to lie down here anymore. And I'm going to say, you do need to lie down here. And I can just go over to my trained dog now and put a little bit of pressure on their blades. And the dog says, I know what that means. Yeah. And they flatten to the ground. Absolutely. And we teach this with a nice, kind method. We show mm -hmm. them that there's a lure so they yep. can follow the lure into the down. And then as that's happening, we put a little bit of pressure on their shoulders. So they get used to following the lure and feeling a little touch on their shoulders. Mm -hmm. And then we'll switch the timing of that. So mm -hmm. it'll be a little bit of pressure first. I'm not pushing or smushing the dog into right. the ground. Yep. I'm just touching their shoulder blades with a tiny little bit of pressure. And then as they feel that pressure, I'm luring with the food. Right. So I switch the timing, it's pressure first, then the lure. And then what I'm gonna do is use the pressure with a signal as I'm weaning away from that food lure. And basically I spend all sorts of time conditioning my dog to understand that when they feel that little touch on the shoulders, it's just like me saying down, it's just another cue. Right. But it gives me a way of gently insisting. So mm. if I say to my dog, okay, lie down, and I give him a clear signal, and I give mm -hmm. him a good command to lie down, and he goes, no, I don't want to, I can say, whoops, you have to. Right. And I can add that little bit of pressure on the shoulders and wait until he does fold back into the down. And of mm -hmm. course, they have prior associations. Most of the time, they're not wanting to really fight us. They're just distracted in that moment. Mm -hmm. It also gives me a tool to say, you must remain in that down until I release you. So if my dog happens to go, oh, there's that bug again right. when he's in his down state. <laughs> right. There's that really interesting bug on the ground again. I'm going to go get up and investigate. Uh -huh. I can say, hey, I can use my follow through. I can say, hey, that's not what you're doing right now. You're right. lying down. And I can take that down placement and mm -hmm. I can help him back into the down position. And again, I can gently insist until I've said, okay, that's good enough. Way right. to go. Gotten in some rewards or mm -hmm. whatever the case may be. And then I can tell him, okay. Mm -hmm. And I can release him to a new spot. Right. I can release him from that down. And he's been successful. I've been successful. Mm -hmm. We've ended the exercise with understanding that you can't get up until mm -hmm. I release you. And without me having to add any sort of huge punitive right. follow through, right. it's just enough follow through to say you must. Mm -hmm. And we, we get a lot of, um, we get a lot of confused people with those particular things, those little bits of follow through where they're not quite sure how to follow through with something. So then of course they don't want to be offensive to the dog or anything right. of that nature. Yes. So they back off and right. then the dog goes, ah, oh, I don't really have to listen right, to that. Yeah. It's not important and enough. It could even be something as innocent as you're in the backyard doing some yard work and suddenly you see the dogs in the flowers and you call his name and the dog says, yeah, I'm going to smell the flowers. And you're so busy with your yard work. You go, oh, what, what does it matter? He can walk in the flowers. However, you've made a big, strong point to your yeah. dog there. You just called his name and allowed him to ignore you. And you've set a precedent. Yeah. And the dog can't differentiate between you know, wandering off at a campsite and wandering in your yard. Yeah. So at that point, you've called his name, he's ignored you. Now you do have to take action. So you have to stop your gardening. 
you have to walk over and, you know, I would repeat his name and give him some tap, 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 taps on the side to get his focus and then encourage him towards you. Exactly. Just that gentle insistence that says, hey, you know what? Remember me over here? Mm -hmm. I called your name. You don't get to ignore me. You have to respond. So, and this is where I think sometimes life is chaotic and because I'm busy in my yard right now and my dog, my dog, you know what? I I need him to have some freedom. So I'm letting him wander around in the yard and Mm -hmm. I'm doing my gardening and I'm sort of dividing my time between us because I feel like it's kinder than leaving him in his crate when I can't fully watch him. But unfortunately, what's that doing? It's not managing him. Exactly. We're going back to he's not being managed properly. Exactly. And little things turn into big things. So innocently ignoring his name and us not following through turns into him yeah. saying, you know what? I don't want to do these things for you anymore because it's like pulling a slot machine. Yes. Sometimes I have to listen, sometimes I don't. Exactly. Absolutely. And in any situation where our dogs are afforded a choice, if the instinctual behavior is more appealing to them mm-hmm. than coming back to us for a cookie, yep. unfortunately, they're probably going to choose that. So, that's and, yes. and that's a normal part of life. You know, we all go through our moments where we're like, you know what, I don't want to do that right now. I'll get back to you in a minute. Right. But unfortunately, with our dogs, that starts to compromise their safety because right. if he thinks it's okay to say, give me a minute in this situation, he's going to think the same thing in other situations. Right. So yes. it's, it's like if your child's playing a video game and, you know, you've worked hard making supper and, you know, you, you know, okay, let, come on, let's come to the table at supper. Nah, I don't want supper. I want to play with my video game. Yeah. You know, right away I'd be, oh no, 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 you are coming to supper. Like yes. put that away. Um, but often we, people aren't as insistent with their dogs. Yeah. They're, yeah. Like, ah, let them be. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. So those three components of management, training and learning how to say no in a nice way, but learning how to say no, learning how to set boundaries, learning how to ensure that your dogs understand that there are specific uh, criteria for Mm -hmm. the commands that we're giving them and setting them up so that they can, they can achieve that criteria, right? right? Mm -hmm. So that means sometimes putting in more time than you had intended to, but you know, these are living, breathing beings that are going to live with us for a long time. And I think you need to ask yourself how you want that relationship to go. Do you want it to be an easy, smooth relationship now? Mm -hmm. So you're ignoring the puppy's bad behavior now, and then a difficult relationship for 12 to 15 years or reverse that Mm -hmm. and have a little bit more work on the front end here and be a good leader, establish yourself with the puppy as understanding that you're going to give them good guidance and give them good advice and direct them well and you're not going to put them in over their heads in situations and then allow them to ignore etc those are all things that are going to contribute to you being a wonderful leader for your dog and having a wonderful relationship with your dog and being able to enjoy all of those things that were the point of training right right? yes having the freedom for them getting to experience the joy you know, it's not about robots. Right, yes. It's about creating a situation where you can safely give your dogs freedom. So think about um, preemptively going into any situations. Think about what might attract the puppy in that room. So what might the puppy be interested in scavenging in? What do you need to Mm -hmm. do to make sure that you're set up in a situation where you have a fail safe in place? You know, if I've got a house line on and my puppy goes and grabs a sock out of the corner, I always use the example of the sock, but who has socks laying around their house? Maybe Um, people with kids. I have, (laughs) no, I, you know what? When I get home and I sit on the couch, I often take my socks off. Well, there you go. And then they just lay on the floor between my coffee table and my couch. So do you have like a massive pile of socks or do you eventually move them out of the living room space? I, no, I eventually move them out of the living room space, but I have, they I have gotten much. up in the morning and walked over and said, oh, there's my socks from last <laughs> night. <laughs> well, there you go then. Right. So puppy in Swanee's house grabs the sock and runs for the hills. And instead of having to play keep away to try to keep them from swallow, swallowing this right, sock yeah. and eventually or wrecking tackling my, them. wrecking my sock, especially wrecking, your, yes, yeah. your mismatched socks. Yes, well, maybe we don't that's want to hole in them. Mismatched right? Her puppies have eaten holes yeah, in them. I've left them on the living room right, and the puppies yeah. have run away with them. Or they play tug and stretch them. That's another, go. yeah. It's like, why, why is my sock so long? <laughs> <laughs> Who was it? Was it Atari that you taught to pull your socks off? Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Atari loved to pull socks off. Yes, <laughs> yes. She was so, so cute, so cute. 
cute. Oh, one of Reggie's favorite tricks is untie my shoe. And, oh, right. Actually, we haven't done it in years now. There is a, a really old YouTube video tutorial that I put together on teaching him how to untie a shoe. So if you're interested in that, <laughs> you can go and check out the really old Trick Tuesday videos <laughs> Sh- on our Shannon YouTube channel. Shannon has different channel. hair in those ones. <laughs> Probably. Different hairdo. And Probably vote on her hairdo. <laughs> put in the comments what Shannon's best hairdo is. <laughs> my hair does change quite a bit actually but it stays red right yeah it changes in length and thickness but it stays red right, all the yes. time I don't and know that I'll ever change that yeah. I, w- I want to say something about leadership and I don't know if I'll say it right so you might have to jump in to save me on this but think of yourself and the people that you trust to follow I love this so someone that you trust to follow is is not somebody who is constantly coddling and cuckooing yeah. and snuggling you and being wishy-washy and a, a leader is as, as we said earlier is confident. someone who's confident yep. who is kind capable. who is calm capable someone who doesn't doesn't lose their emotions they yeah. they are able to okay you know what everything around us is falling apart but you can count on me let's get you through this yeah absolutely so they're yeah so yeah, if I'm in a room full of clowns, I'm not running to the other person in the room that's cowering and rocking back and that, forth in the counter in exactly. the corner who's also afraid of clowns. I'm right. looking at Swanee who's laughing hysterically Woo, and I'm going to follow Swanee out of the room right. because she's not afraid. So right. she's probably the I'll best case scenario punching. to keep me safe. <laughs> yes. So yeah. yeah, that's what I'm trying to say. Yes. So you want to be that person to your puppy. Yeah. So, you know, there is a time to snuggle and have fun with them and well, I have fun all the time, but to snuggle and and get that human nurturing emotion out. Sometimes we just want to do that. Yeah, of course. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. As I do, I hold Honda and I smooch him and I do all those things, but I am also that confident leader. Yes. I'm that person that that person that Honda says, you know what, Christine, I am loyal to you. I will follow you to the ends of the earth because I know that you can keep me safe. Yes. And then that dog as well gets into the habit of listening. So then we don't even have to work as hard with the training piece because the dog is already saying, you are worth listening to. You are worth following. What do you got for me now? Because you bring the fun, you bring all the good stuff and you keep me safe. I feel confident with you. Right. And I know like when I walk through a haunted house, I am absolutely terrified. Shannon will attest to that. I will attest to that. But if I had my dog with me, I would even though inside I am dying, oh, I would say, you know what? I'm pulling myself together for the good of my dog. Yeah. And I would confidently walk through that haunted house, even though inside me, I don't like this situation. But I want my dog to look at me as someone that they can, they can Absolutely. trust. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. I love that. So having that energy that says... I'm calm, cool, and collected will definitely go down the leash to your dog. Now, right. it's not going to teach them how to come when they're called no, just by no. you, you know, pretending that you feel in charge of the world. Right. You yes. still have to take the time to put in the training time. But yes, the it's training going, time is important. Yes. Absolutely. But that confidence and having good energy to relay to your dog, mm-hmm. you know, not um, not going to pieces when they make a mistake, not right. uh, not you know, falling down and thinking, oh, that's it. He didn't do it perfectly this time. So it's not going to be great in the future and not going to the extreme opposite of that and allowing the dog to break the rules repetitively Mm. or to experiment in ways that are rule breakers, but they don't necessarily know yet because you're creating that rehearsal. Yes. Yeah. So think of people in your life, like, you know, your bosses you've had at work or coworkers or, you know, people you've played sports with or went to school with, uh, you know, people in your church you know, people that have inspired you. Yeah. Yes. And, and the people that you crave when you need some sort of guidance. Yes. Be that for your dog. Yes. Yes. Brilliant. Mm -hmm. I think that's a good point to end on. I think so so too. Yeah. Thank you for joining us today. I am instructor Shannon. Instructor Swanee. Happy training. The McCann Dogs Podcast is brought to you by McCann Professional Dog Trainers. We help dog owners to have a well-behaved four-legged family member. Please give us a call at 905 659-1888 659-1888 or visit us at McCandogs.com. Happy training!